where something eventually reaches saturation. And the S-curve is the beginning of some kind of bump that goes down again. <laughs> and there is uh, just this thing that when you are in sight of an evolution of life, you are on top of a puddle of negentropy that is being sucked dry by life. And yeah. during uh, that happening, you see an increase in complexity. Yeah. Because life forms are competing with each other to get more and more and uh, in a, uh, finer and finer corner of yeah. of that like see, entropy extraction. See, but that I feel like that's a gradual, beautiful process. Like that's almost you know follows a process akin to evolution, and the way it comes down is not the same way it came up. <laughs> the way it comes down is usually harshly and quickly. So usually there's some kind of catastrophic event. Well, the Roman Empire took a long time. Uh, but that's, uh, would that be, would you classify that as, as a decrease in complexity though? Yes. I think that this uh, size of the cities that could be fed has decreased dramatically. And you could see that the quality of the art decreased and it did so gradually. And maybe um, future generations, when they look at the history of the United States in the 21st century, will also talk about the gradual decline, not something that suddenly happens. Do you have a sense of where we are? Are we on the exponential rise? Are we at the peak? Or are we at the downslope of the the United States empire? It's very hard to say from a single human perspective, but I, it seems to me that we are probably um, at the peak. I think that's probably the definition of like optimism and cynicism. So my nature of optimism is, I think we're on the rise. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think this is just all a matter of perspective. Nobody knows, but I do think that erring on the side of optimism, like you need a sufficient number, you need a minimum number of optimists in order to make that up thing actually work. And so I, I tend to be on the side of the optimists. I think that we are basically a species of grasshoppers that have turned into locusts. And when you are in that locust mode, you see an amazing rise of population numbers and of the local complexity of the interactions between the individuals. But uh, it's ultimately the question is, is it sustainable? See, I think we're a bunch of lions and tigers that have become domesticated cats, uh, to use a different metaphor. And so I'm not exactly sure we're so destructive. We're just softer and nicer and lazier. But I think we have monkeys and not the cats. And if you look at the monkeys, they are very busy. Uh, the, the ones that have a lot of sex, those monkeys? Not just the bonobos. I think that all the monkeys are basically a discontent species that always needs to meddle. <laughs> well, the gorillas seem to have a, a little bit more of a structure, but it's a different, different part of the tree. <laughs> okay. Uh, you mentioned the elephant and the, the monkey riding the elephant. And... Uh, Consciousness is the monkey, and there's some prodding that the monkey gets to do, and sometimes the elephant listens. I heard you got into some contentious, maybe you can correct me, but I heard you got into some contentious free will discussions. Um, is this with Sam Harris or something like that? Not some that I know of. I, I, <laughs> some, some people on Clubhouse <laughs> told me you made a, a, a bunch of uh, um, big debate points about free will. Well, let me just then ask you where, where, in terms of the monkey and the elephant, uh, do you think we land in terms of the illusion of free will? How much control does the monkey have? Well, we have to think about what the um, free will is in the first place. We are not the machine. We are not the thing that is making the decisions. We are a model of that decision-making process. Yeah. And there is a difference between making your own decisions and predicting your own decisions. Yes. And that difference is the first person perspective. And what um, basically makes decision making um, and the conditions of free will distinct from just automatically doing the best thing is that uh, we often don't know what the best thing is. We make decisions under uncertainty. We make informed bets using a betting algorithm that we don't yet understand because we haven't reverse engineered our own minds sufficiently. We don't know the expected rewards. We don't know the mechanism by which we estimate the rewards and so on. But there we is only, an algorithm. We observe ourselves performing, mm -hmm. where we see that uh, we weight facts and factors and the future, and then 
some kind of possibility, some motive gets raised to an intention. And that's informed bet that the system is making. And that making of the informed bet, the representation of that is what we call free will. And it seems to be paradoxical because we think that the crucial thing is about it, that it's somehow indeterministic. And yet, if it was indeterministic, it would be random. And it cannot be random because it was if it was random, if just dice were being thrown and the universe randomly forces you to do things, it would be meaningless. So the important part of the decisions is always the deterministic stuff. But um, it appears to be indeterministic to you because it's unpredictable. Because if it was predictable, you wouldn't experience it as a free will decision. Right. You would experience it as just doing the necessary right thing. And you see this continuum between the free will and the execution of automatic behavior when you're observing other people. So for instance, when you are observing your own children, if you don't understand them, you will uh, use this agent model where you have a con agent with a set point generator mm -hmm. and uh, the agent is doing the best it can to minimize the difference to the set point and it might be confused and uh, sometimes impulsive or whatever, but it's acting on its own free will. Mm -hmm. And when you understand what happens in the mind of the child, you see that it's automatic and you can outmodel the child, you can build things around the child that will lead the child to making exactly the decision that you are predicting. And in, under these circumstances, like when you are a stage musician or somebody who is dealing uh, with people that this, uh, you sell a car to and you completely understand the psychology and the impulses and the space of thoughts that this individual can have at that moment, under these circumstances, it makes no sense to attribute free will.